Hi, everyone. This is America Adapts, the climate change podcast. Hey, Adapters. Welcome back to a very special episode. This is the first in a two-part series I'm doing with the Nantucket Conservation Foundation and the Trustees of Reservations, two land conservation organizations based in Massachusetts, who together jointly own and manage Cuscata Kotu Wildlife Refuge on the island of Nantucket. Kicking off, we'll be focusing on the history of this special place and what conditions are like today with interviews from experts and community members. This podcast is being sponsored by an anonymous donor as part of an ongoing project between NCF and the trustees to confront climate-driven challenges faced by the refuge. First, let me paint a picture of this unique property. The refuge is a barrier beach system which juts out into the Atlantic Ocean, forming the northernmost point of the island and wrapping around as the protective barrier beach for Nantucket's harbor. Its 1,452 acres account for approximately 5% of the island's total landmass. Together, the trustees and NCF are working to identify resilient intervention methods and adaptation strategies that can maintain beach access and sustain habitat and barrier beach integrity using the property's diverse acreage as a living laboratory. This podcast series is part of the project's first phase to broadly communicate and illustrate both the beauty and challenges unique to this special place. So thanks to these two organizations for sponsoring the series. We'll have one more episode focusing on what can be done to adapt to the climate-driven changes ahead. You're going to go behind the scenes on what makes this property special, what it may be facing in the coming years, and what adaptation options are on the minds of locals as we hear from experts and community members. This is our chance to go on the ground and hear how people value this iconic place and what steps they're willing to take to protect and adapt these areas to existing and future impacts of climate change. This was a fascinating opportunity for me to talk with people from Nantucket, a place so many of us hear about, and how that island is approaching climate change. Okay, first off is Cormac Collier, NCF president and CEO, who's going to give us some background on this partnership before a few stakeholders join me to share their own experiences. All right, let's take a journey to Nantucket. Hey, Adapters. Joining me is Cormac Collier. Cormac is the president of the Nantucket Conservation Foundation. Hi, Cormac. Welcome to the podcast. Hey, how are you? Thanks for having me here. Well, it's a treat to have you on. Well, let's get started and just give us some background. What is the Nantucket Conservation Foundation? The Conservation Foundation is a land trust on Nantucket Island. Uh, We've been in existence since 1963. Through all of the efforts that we've done in the past many decades, we've acquired over 9,000 acres on the island in permanent conservation. And that's upwards of one third of the total land mass of the island. Wow. So is your holdings, is that like the principal thing that tourists use when they come to the island? Both tourists, day day visitors, weekend visitors, weekly visitors, also seasonal and year-round residents, all open for the public for their enjoyment. Also trying to balance the ecological integrity and the importance of our holdings with public access and public visitation. Okay, so in a normal year, how many people are visiting your properties? Uh, we're saying thousands. Um, Nantucket's a, a, a resort community. We have about, on average, about 18,000 to 20,000 year-round residents. And then that balloons upwards of 60, 65,000 individuals that are living or visiting on the island at any one time. And many of them come for our open space, for our beaches, for our trails, for our windy walks through various plant communities and ecosystems. And it's quite a draw for a lot of people that not only live here, but visit as well. Okay, so you also have a science and research program at the foundation? Our main focus over the past 50 years has been acquisition, acquiring land for open space protection. But as we got on through our um, work, we realized that there was a necessity to do the proper stewardship and investigation of uh, the natural resources on our properties. So beginning in the 1990s, we started a science and stewardship department and has now grown to about five year-round individuals with two seasonal staff. And we study a variety of uh, disciplines from freshwater ecology, salt marsh ecology, bats, um, reptiles, amphibians, anything that really exists on our property, you name it, we we review it. 
The properties themselves make up a, a wide array of different micro plants and wildlife communities. And many of them are quite unique to Massachusetts and actually the world as well. We have um, some of the best sandplain grassland habitats in the actual the Northeast and the country as well. Nantucket Island is this world famous island and many of us can't even visualize what really is on the island. Could you share just a few more of the unique ecosystems that, that are there? Yeah. So I, I touched upon a little bit about the sandplain grasslands, which is a disturbance dependent community. That it means that it needs um, various impacts to it, whether it's mowing or tilling over time, a prescribed fire we've tried as well. And those plants are adapted to that type of impact, and they're actually very unique and rare. And some of them are state listed in the state of Massachusetts. There's other ecosystems that are here, such as uh, wetlands, saltwater ponds, embayments, harbors. And what we're speaking about today is really our fantastic barrier beach ecosystem of Kotu and Koskeda. Okay, so you are partnering with the Trustees of Reservation on this project. Could you give us a bit of background on that partnership? Absolutely. We've been, as I said, working with our acquisition team to protect upwards of 9,000 acres. Of that, we have a lot of uh, open access beaches and barrier beach ecosystems as well. One of them being this northerly barrier beach ecosystem, which protects the entirety of Nantucket Harbor. Our partners in conservation, the trustees of reservations, they protect contiguous acres to our holdings going up to Great Point and also a very fantastic area called the Cuscada Woods. Through the years, we've done a lot of research in terms of the wildlife and plant communities that are out there. We've done also a lot of engagement with visitors. And one of the challenges that we face uh, now and we're really seeing it more recently in the past 10 years, is the threats to this ecosystem due to sea level rise. We are partnering with the trustees to first and foremost identify areas that are most vulnerable to sea level rise, and then working with the assistance of certain consultants and other individuals, we're going to be coming up with innovative ways and strategies to make those areas more resilient, but also in keeping with the ecological and biological integrity of those areas themselves. So it sounds like you are full on planning climate adaptation there at the refuge. How are you integrating the local residents and tourists? Do they know what you're doing here and do they know the threat of sea level rise? Is that something that's spoken about much? Yeah, sea level rise certainly has become quite the buzzword on Nantucket, certainly up and down the coastal communities of the United States, but really particularly in Nantucket in the past three to five years because of some new projections that have been put forth by state, federal, and independent agencies about the actual sea level rise and elevation rise in uh, 20, 30, 40, 50, 70 years. And then we put those uh, projections uh, upon some of our properties and elsewhere in terms of areas that are not necessarily are conserved, but that are already built out. And people certainly get a little concerned. Infrastructure is threatened. Buildings are threatened. Our open space is threatened. Our beaches, our dunes, and our salt marshes are threatened. And really, we're putting a lot of energy now and a lot of attention in terms of identifying those resources identifying how they can become more resilient to sea level rise and what sort of planning and actually action is necessary to take the next steps. So you'd mentioned earlier that you were in the business of land acquisition, but now it's really more of a focus on science and research. But when you look at some of the sea level rise projections, you might have to think about some of your lands that might be lost to the sea. How does that influence what you're doing there? It's very interesting. Some of our holdings are on the south end of the island, which have some fairly fantastic plant communities. Those are fairly susceptible to erosion and have lost quite significant acreage over the past 10, 20, 30 years. We have to look at those areas and determine how we can potentially mitigate for some of those losses and help facilitate the production of some of those plant communities in, in other areas as well. Have you had a chance to communicate with other islands? Islands have this unique situation where they're threatened by sea level rise and you're not necessarily going to retreat inland. So are you talking to other islands? I know Martha's Vineyards is doing some things, but even areas that might be farther away from Nantucket? 
Yeah, we've certainly talked with Martha's Vineyard and similar type communities as it relates to some impacts from sea level rise on man-made infrastructure and resources. We ourselves, the Conservation Foundation, have been working with our colleagues in other areas, not just even on islands, but on uh, the coastal communities that have, that are really seeing some threats to estuarine resources. One of our biggest concerns is really what sea level rise will do to our salt marsh ecosystems, which are some of the most productive ecosystems on the planet and have multiple, multiple benefits. If those are lost or the salt marshes are not allowed to migrate, we're essentially going to be losing a very, very important beneficial ecosystem over time. So we've been speaking with our colleagues, our other scientists, academic institutions to see what sort of strategies they've been employing in terms of protecting certain ecosystems such as salt marshes in their own communities. Okay, so in the past year, we've had this dramatic response to COVID. It's impacted everyone, and I imagine tourism dropped dramatically on Nantucket. But I hear that even this year, there's just been a huge rebound. The vaccines have come out, and you're seeing, I guess, a lot of people coming out. How have you guys adjusted? I'm sure that was quite a whiplash. It's quite a whiplash for the economic community, but it's a very beneficial whiplash at the end of the day for the stimulation of the tourist economy to come back. What was very interesting for the Conservation Foundation and similar land trust open space protection institutions during COVID is that when COVID came, we saw an incredible spike in visitor use. There wasn't a lot Hmm. to do inside. There weren't restaurants to go to, or there weren't movie theaters, there weren't social clubs in terms of watching music or any venues. So we saw, and there wasn't gyms, there wasn't any gyms, there wasn't any other indoor recreational. So we saw so many people utilize our properties, which is quite rewarding to actually see how beneficial this open space is. And it was quite, we always knew it, we always knew the importance of open space, but for those that just took it for granted over the years, and then here they see it. It's really one of their only outlets for doing something during these very difficult times. And to have that uh, resource available to them, we heard so much appreciation in the community. So we certainly saw impacts to the economy, but the foundation itself, our properties were busier than ever. Wow. So someone listening to this podcast, how can they learn more about what you guys are up to? I'm sure everyone's interested in different ways to do coastal management and coastal adaptation. Where should they go? Yeah, so certainly one of the best resources that we have is our website, uh, www.nantucketconservation.org. And that has a wealth of information about our uh, land management strategy, our science and stewardship department, and a lot of the projects and programs that they're doing, particularly as it relates to the topic today, sea level rise and salt marsh investigation and protection. We also have a science blog that can be signed up through that website. And we have regular updates and newsletters, uh, updates about our work that people can get involved, more involved in. Do you have a favorite spot in the KOTU Refuge? One of my favorite spots is one of the points. It's called Five Fingered Point. It's a, one of the cuspate spits that extend southward into the harbor. And it really is on a particular time of the day with the angle of the sun shining just right. You get this gorgeous, gorgeous view east to west of the entire harbor, and then a fairly peaceful beach that's quiet. And that's the really nice thing. It's quiet, and it's a place to escape and relax. Well, thanks, Cormac, for coming on and talking about the foundation and appreciate all the work that you're doing. Thanks so much for your time. Really appreciate it. Hey, Adapters. Joining me is Nathaniel Philbrick. Nathaniel is an American author of history, a winner of the National Book Award for In the Heart of the Sea, and finalist for the Pulitzer Prize. Hi, Nat. Welcome to the podcast. Hey, it's great to join you. Well, this is a real treat to have you on. Famous author. I don't get to talk to famous authors that often on a climate podcast, but I appreciate you making the time. But how long have you been a resident of Nantucket? We moved here in 1986 when our kids were one and four. And so we have, we've been here, uh, we're year rounders, you know, we don't go back and forth, but we've been here 36 years. Wow. So you've written extensively about the island. 
Yeah, I was, uh, I sort of discovered history uh, after moving to Nantucket. Nantucket was the whaling capital of the world. And Moby Dick was my favorite novel of all times. And so it was sort of through the lens of Melville that I, I really got into the island's history. And that led me to my first book about Nantucket, A Way Offshore. And in a chapter of that was the story of the Essex, the whale ship from Nantucket that was rammed by a whale and was the inspiration for the climax of Moby Dick. And so really moving to Nantucket launched me on the career I followed ever since. Okay, I guess I'm just curious about that, too. So you're on the island and you're getting interested in those things. But what is it? Is it just looking at the landscape and your own background, understanding Moby Dick or are there local people or there the libraries there that just have different resources? Yeah, a little bit of all of that. You know, for the first thing, Nantucket's an island, and there is something about islands. You know, there's a moat around us that's uh, 30 plus miles wide, and it, it seems to intensify experiences. You know, that's why Darwin was in the Galapagos when the theory of evolution hit him. You know, the highs are higher, the lows are lower, and I realized after moving here, I was just fascinated with the people who had preceded us on this island. And I just, I, it became a kind of local story for me that ultimately led to the history of not just the United States, but the world, because whaling was truly a global business in the 18th and 19th centuries. And so, but the other thing was, it was very personal in a way, you know, it was my home. I knew there had been, you know, Quakers had been the dominant religion at one point. The island was predominantly Native American for uh, well into the f 50 years into the English settlement. It was a profoundly native place at the beginning. And, you know, the other thing was the resources were here in a way that I really didn't appreciate at the beginning since I was kind of new to history. Uh, there was, there's the Nantucket Historical Association that has the Whaling Museum and which has just an incredible archive of, of logs, journals, letters. Uh, then there's the Nantucket Athenaeum, our library, which ha had just microfilmed uh, the, the newspaper collection. And uh, then you have our town building, which has town meetings going back to 1660. And so it was, you know, and they're all within an eighth of a mile of each other. And it wow. didn't involve much of a commute. So for me, it was just you know, it was what I was, I realized belatedly kind of what it was destined to do. So whale watching is a popular thing. And I'm assuming it's it's popular there in Nantucket. And I, your own, you focus on Melville and Moby Dick and wondering this evolution of Nantucket. And now whale watching is such an important part of like, the New England experience. And just your, what do you think of that? Your, this This whole evolution of what whales mean yeah. to that island? Oh, it, it's really interesting because, you know, here we have this whaling museum, which kind of glorifies the slaughter of these creatures that are so important to us now in the 21st century. And Nantucketers have evolved. Back 150 years ago, if you were a 14-year-old kid, instead of going to high school, you went on a whaling voyage and came back three years having traveled the world and killed as many whales as you could. Now, an entirely different uh, attitude prevails. There's an, a mam uh, marine mammal stranding team full of volunteers that whenever a, a whale wa or a, a, a seal or, or uh, a dolphin washes up, goes out and helps them. And the in the epilogue of my book, In the Heart of the Sea, about the whale ship Essex, I was working on that book when a sperm whale, and sperm whales are actually very rare, rarely seen around here. But while I was working on this book, this sperm whale washed up on the east end of Nantucket, Wisconsin, and it eventually died. But it became this, this huge point of, it was a calamity initially, because everybody wanted that whale to get out there and, and be okay, but uh, it had been injured apparently, perhaps in a collision with a ship, and it died. And uh, then they thought, well, let's turn this tragedy into an opportunity. And uh, with the state's permission, they used the Nantucketers' age-old techniques of stripping the blubber from a dead whale, buried the bones so that they, they could the, the what was left on there could decompose, and those bones are now on display over the, the Great Hall of the Whaling Museum. Wow, fantastic story. Do you get to visit the Kosketa Kotu Refuge frequently? Yeah, uh, we we uh, pronounce it Kosketa. Kos <laughs> okay. okay. Kosketa Kotu. Kosketa is one of my uh, favorite places 
on the planet. It, there's a, a pond and this high grove of cedars overlooking it. And, you know, the Nantucket Harbor is seven miles long and it's at the very edge of that harbor. So, you know, you have this big harbor leading to it. And then on the edge is 3000 miles away, Portugal. And, you know, it's this grove of trees beside a pond at the edge of the universe. It's it's just terrific. And then Co2, which is the uh, sand spit, kind of a scalloped sand spit that leads east west from that uh, is also just uh, an incredible piece of property. It's, you know, it's, it's our borderland between us and Nantucket Sound. It's, it's, you know, it catches the waves before the waves catch us. I guess we can't go into too much detail, but can you give us some historical stories about the refuge? Yeah, well, you know, the refuge was, uh, it's interesting. The, the, when the Nantucketers came here way back in the 1600s, they initially were going to be uh, sheep farmers. That was uh, This was an island without any wolves, uh, which was very unusual for New England. So it made it a perfect place to raise sheep. But then they realized, uh, partly through the uh, help of the, the uh, Wampanoag, the, the native peoples here, that, you know, hey, there are these whales that show up on the South Shore every fall and stick around through the winter into the spring, right whales. And so following the native lead, they began to whale. And that led, you know, that completely changed everything. Sheep remained, but whaling was now it. And for whale bo- whaling, you needed whale boats, 25 foot long open boats, six people in them, and you built them with cedar. And and so they would head out and there are island there back then there are islands that are now underwater because of global warming but back then they were uh, thick with cedar trees as was Co2 and the Nantucketers stripped those outlying islands of cedar and were turning their attention to the to Co2 when the town fathers realized if we lose our cedar trees on Co2 we're going to be in trouble so they outlawed the taking of red cedar from Co2 and so you see that uh, you know uh, early in the, the historical record it's been a refuge in a, in a way from the very beginning of the english settlement and you know what's happening today is I think, perfectly in keeping with that tradition. And, you know, it's for us, well, there's not a lot of trees on Nantucket. You know, we're a sandbank, middle of the ocean. With, it's, we're the wind, one of the windiest places on the East Coast. It's a tough environment for trees, but out there in Cote 2 and particularly Cascada, you have them. It's, it's an important place that's, you know, not it's it's outlying. So if you live on Nantucket, it's not the first thing in your uh, point of focus, but it's absolutely essential to the, the overall health of this island. You're, you're uniquely positioned as an author and a historian to think about these issues. How has climate change come up and what do you even think about the, the topic in regards to where you live? Oh, you know, it's I remember when we first got here. You know, people, I, I befriended a guy named Wes Tiffany, who was on the staff of the UMass Boston Field Station. And Wes, he was trained in botany, but had become an erosion expert after living on Nantucket for decades. And he was the first person, in my experience, to start saying, look, in as little as 200 years, things are going to change on this island. It's so low-lying. The highest point on Nantucket is at our town dump at 100 feet. (laughs) And so it's not going to take much uh, sea level rise to have a huge impact. And, you know, back then it was, yeah, 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 you know, that's that's what you're saying, Wes. But now that's all changed. You know, people are, are analyzing it. And one of the things they're realizing is that CO2 will be one of the first things to go. And if CO2 is lost, that means Nantucket Harbor and the town of Nantucket will be naked to the northerly, uh, northeasterlies that ravage the, this area in the winter. And so, you know, that's, that's, it's going to, it's going to create all sorts of, of havoc. So it's a reality that is settling in. And, you know, when people look at the science and are willing to look at the science, they can't help but begin to say, we have to begin to plan around this. You know, our lifeline is a ferry. And uh, you need to have a ferry terminal <laughs> for that ferry to get here. And so things are going to change, I, uh, you know, if, if not in my lifetime, in the lifetime of my children and their children. 
Well, when you think about these things and how the landscapes could change, you, you as a writer and as a historian, you've written about how these landscapes, what has gone on on these landscapes. But now these are landscapes that potentially could be lost and they're not going to even be there anymore making history. Does that influence at all the things that you think about writing or just ponder? Oh, absolutely. I remember early on after we had moved here on Nantucket, we have the Nantucket Town Meeting, which means this is democracy at at its bare knuckle best. You know, we don't elect representatives. We go to the uh, high school auditorium and vote on, you know, proposals before the town. And one of them was uh, uh, the, the east end of the island has been particularly hit hard with erosion. And one of them was whether the town was going to contribute to an attempt to delay erosion uh, at a beach out there. And I remember, you know, one guy stood up and said, you know, anyone who builds their house beside a beach is asking for trouble. That's why all the old time Nantucketers lived in town away from the the edges of this island. You know, if you the summer people who do this are getting what they deserve. And then it was my neighbor uh, who lived just down the street. He's no longer with us, but he said, you know, I'm hearing both sides, but he said, you know, when I die, I'm going to be buried on this island, and I don't want my coffin floating around Brant Point, uh, which is the, the, the point <laughs> around which the ferry comes in to Nantucket Harbor. And sure enough, he appealed to the island, you know, and then they voted for that, that uh, pr- particular proposal. And so, you know, it gets at the very essence of who we are and and what we are on this planet. And, you know, will this place be here after we die? No, it won't after a certain period of time. And so, you know, in a way, it's a metaphor for all of us. You know, the sun is going to explode and all of all of the earth will go uh, into oblivion. You know, so that's the destiny. But on an island like this, uh, that is slowly and now quickly eroding, that destiny seems a little closer. What is your opinion about the future of Nantucket? And you've sort of alluded to in some of your previous answers, but just really, what are you thinking 2050? Not in the too far future, but what is the future of Nantucket? Yeah, well, you know, what I've seen is the, the, that 100 year storm that pretty, you know, floods uh, downtown Nantucket is now becoming an annual event. And um, it's, it's just coming. It's coming. And the town is building some parks beside the harbor that I just, you just think they're going to get, they're, they're just not going to be there uh, the next bad storm. And so, you know, I, I really think it's important that the town come to grips with realizing that the margin against the harbor and the sea is is moving forward. And so, you know, I think I don't know, you know, what will it do to real estate when people begin to realize, you know, the island's days are are numbered to a certain extent. It may make it more precious in the short term. I don't know. But it's it's one thing that was in the background when we first got here and for the first decades we were here, but is now really in the forefront. And I think we'll you know, thank goodness there is always a generation because we really need people who will put away their nostalgia for the way Nantucket was. Because Nantucketers, many of them, you know, had their greatest summer of their youth when they were 18 on a Nantucket beach <laughs> and never want the island to change from that. And and th- that's dangerous, that kind of nostalgia for the way it was. And then you have historic creation, you know, which is, uh, this is a historic town, uh, a fascinating thing to be preserved. But, you know, its days are numbered. What do you do? Do you move that historic town to the high ground behind it? Do you, you know, what do you do? You know, and I'm not in a position to answer those questions, but man, they are going to be tough scenarios to think through and ultimately come to some decision. So do you have a favorite spot on Nantucket and why? Well, I actually have two favorite spots. One of them is what we mentioned earlier, the Cascada Pond. Every uh, summer, my wife and I figure out when high tide is at noon, 
and then uh, head down in our sailboat, uh, sailing the full seven-mile length of Nantucket Harbor to the entrance to Cascada Pond. It's actually a salt pond connected by a little narrow sliver of, of a channel. And we sail in, sail to the pond, do a ceremonial lap, and then have lunch on the beach. And then uh, after lunch, now that the tide is flowing out, we sail out of the, har- out of the, the pond and then back up the harbor to our mooring seven miles away. And, and for me, it's just a numinal experience every time. It's, I, I, it, it just seems to connect me not only with the island, but the universe in a, in a, in a nice, watery way. And then the other one is an entirely different part of the island. In, it, it, pretty much in the center of the island is what's called Ultra Rock. It was uh, apparently, uh, it's the highest point of the island, just over 100 feet high. It's, it's almost as high as, as the highest point in the dump. And it's a stunning view. You know, it's it's not much height uh, if you're from the west, but if you're on Nantucket, as high as it gets. And you can just see what are known as the moors, the rolling uh, landscape, uh, grasslands uh, that are typify the eastern end of the island. And you can see Nant- on either side of Nantucket, you can see the ocean uh, to the south and the sound to the north. It's it's as close as you're ever going to get on land to seeing Nantucket in its entirety. It was a sacred place to the Native Americans, and from my from my perspective, it's it's still as sacred of places uh, they come on Nantucket. And so between those two, those are my my favorites. Wow, two very excellent examples. Now this has been a real treat chatting with you, and I appreciate you sharing your perspective on what's going on in Nantucket. And thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Well, it's been great to talk to you, Doug. A, a real pleasure. Hey, Adapters. Joining me is Teal Ziklas Colleton. Hi, Teal. Welcome to the podcast. Hi. Nice to be chatting with you. Well, it's a pleasure to have you on, and you are a longtime resident of Nantucket Island. How long have you lived on the island? We go back many generations. My mother's side of the family goes back many generations. Maybe we don't want to dig too deep, but what, what's the story right. there? How did they get over to Nantucket Island and why? Well, they were primarily far- sheep farmers and we didn't have any whaling captains in our family, mm-hmm. but primarily sheep farmers and living off the land. Well, we're talking about the Kotu Refuge and your family is responsible for the donation of the land that has become the refuge. Can you tell us about that? Why did they donate the land and what's the whole story there? In 1974, so uh, originally my grandfather was dedicated to purchasing and preserving the land up there. He realized that it was very special, and so he wanted to preserve it for families to go up and picnic, to people to go hunting and fishing without, you know, building on it or even though it was, it's all sand, but at the time there were no real regulations. But it was to preserve the property. So in 1974, my grandmother, Harriet Withers Backus, decided that because the property had gotten so popular, so many people with SUVs going up there, and it was very difficult to manage it from our family standpoint. So she decided, along with my mother and my father, decided to give over 800 acres to the trustees so that they could formally manage, formally protect and really just pay attention and allow people to go up there safely and while protecting the property. So your grandfather was the originator of this. I mean, I'm assuming you, you, you knew your grandfather. You got to spend time with him. I'm not quite. Did you ever have a conversation with him, especially when you were younger? And did, did he talk much about why he was doing this and why it was important to him? No, he didn't. Well, I was a kid when he died, but he was just dedicated to preserving the land. You know, he knew that the wildlife and the fishing and preserving it for families was really, really important. And he lived that. He didn't talk about it. He lived it. But I was, uh, you know, also I was a kid. You know, I was probably 10 years old when he died. But he spent a lot of time on the property and just genuinely loved it. Now, why the trustees of reservations? Why was it that group that seemed like a good fit for donating land to? My grandmother and her family attorney decided they met with Gordon Abbott at the time and really liked who he was, what the organization 
stood for, and they were, I don't know, it was just a good fit. Do you get to visit the refuge very often? Oh, yeah. And my sister lives out on a house in Wawinet, and her house looks out over the property across the harbor. So we, yeah, we spend a lot of time out there. It gets kind of crowded in the summer, but we go out there when we can, and my sister looks out over it every day of her life. I thought maybe the number of visitors visiting during COVID would actually go down, but it sounds like because everyone wanted to go outside because you couldn't be inside that the refuge actually saw an uptick in visitors. Did you notice this? I did. Yeah. And so did the uh, property manager, Diane Lang, who, by the way, does just a magnificent job managing the property. She noticed it as well. And we have periodic meetings. I'm on the trustee, the board for the trustees for the property. And so we chat about it, you know, how interesting it is, the ebb and flow of the the visitors to the to the property. You know, ha- some of the time in the summer, people are not allowed to go all the way out to Great Point because of the nesting birds, the federally regulated nesting birds. So, but even though people can't go all the way out there, it's very, very popular. It's a beautiful piece of property, you know, very few place, places like it on the planet. You probably never thought of that, but you, there's this donated land from your family that so many people get to benefit from, but it actually brought so much probably peace of mind for people going through this pandemic that that must have, be something that you, you must think about a little bit. Yeah, I, you know, that is true. It is a very peaceful on one side of it. The It's a skinny strip of land. Most of it is a pretty skinny strip of land. And on one side, the sun rises and on the other side, the sun sets. So you can't, you know, any time of the day that you go up there, it's beautiful. Well, as a longtime resident of Nantucket, just even the refuge or even the island itself, have you noticed any changes? And I guess more toward the natural landscape. Well, sure. You know, the, this property changes all the time. My father did a study many, many years ago of what he called the wagging of Great Point, which is the very tip of the property, the farthest northern tip. And if you look at photos from historical photos, you see Great Point going to the left, a little bit to the right, then back to the left again, and they called it the wagging. So the it changes all the time, but it, sure, because of climate change, erosion. We have these slow moving storms now. If they come from the northeast, you know, that washes the the water washes over the sand and, and you know it's it's very concerning, but there are a lot of really, really smart people who are working on this. And some of them that are affiliated with the trustees doing studies about different places that are more fragile and different options that we all have to try to foster the lack of erosion. You mentioned climate change, and this episode is going to be about climate change. How does that come up with you? And as a resident of the island, does it come up in conversations with other residents? And when you talk to the people at the trustees, they have to start thinking about sea level rise and how they're going to manage the property. Have you been able to even listen in or participate in any sort of those discussions? Sure. Everybody talks about it because there's an awful lot of this island that is just, you know, a foot above sea level. So it's like some of it is like a barrier island. You know, I don't know if you've been down to the South Carolina or, you know, the, down that way. It's like a bar- barrier island. So everybody's talking about it. Everybody's worried about it. They have done a lot of things to the town of Nantucket because if Kotu or Cascada gets compromised in some of these very large northeast storms, the water would come right into Nantucket town And so they're doing some things to shore up the wharves and the area where in the in Nantucket Harbor. But everybody's talking about it. You know, it's just something that anybody that lives on a fragile piece of property like this, I'm sure they're talking about it everywhere where there's islands. So do you have a favorite spot in the refuge? I would say Cascada Pond, which is a lovely little pond with trees around it in the osprey nest there. and But the actual tip of Great Point is a beautiful spot too, but we haven't been able to get there for many years because the endangered seals have taken over that spot. So people are not allowed to walk out there. It's all fenced off. But I would say Cascada Pond. 
Teal, thank you so much. Thank you for your family donating the property in the first place, or we wouldn't even be doing this podcast. And thanks for all that you're doing. Well, I appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Hey, Adapters. Joining me is Neil Foley. Neil is the Interpretive Education Coordinator at the Nantucket Conservation Foundation. Hi, Neil. Welcome to the podcast. Hey, Doug. How are you doing? Oh, I'm doing great. Well, let's just start off by you giving us some background. What do you do as the Education Interpretive Coordinator? It's kind of a broad ranging role. Like I have a, I have a science background. I started off doing wildlife ecology and, and moving around the country. When I came to Nantucket, I had a, a different position uh, as the co-tier ranger, but now I do a lot of community outreach. I lead walks every week during the season and in the off season. I engage with our schools, do a lot of social media as well to try and get out all of the incredible work and science projects that we do here at the Conservation Foundation. Okay, so how long have you been doing this newer position? A new position, I started in September 2019, so a little over a year and a half. <laughs> we had a um, bit of an odd year there too, right? Yeah, yeah, that first year really took a turn. But <laughs> I mean, we kept in good spirits, we soldiered on, and luckily I was able to do some walks last year, even with masks on, now that we're we're kind of taking things off and loosening up a little bit, it's good to do some walks outside with people out and about and really engage with how people have been appreciating the open space on Nantucket, which we have so much of. Let's talk a, a little bit about what you were doing prior to this, because I'm sure it informs your new position. And you actually lived on the KOTU Refuge for a while, right? Yeah. So, so when I came into the island in 2014, I had a lot of shorebird experience under my belt. And this job popped up being the KOTU Ranger and Shorebird Monitor for the Nantucket Conservation Foundation. And what it entailed was a little bit of everything. It was the, the hardcore data collection and species protection that I had engaged with for years but it was also a little bit of public relations because there's a lot of visitors to the refuge that you have to talk with and, and talk about the projects and talk about why we're protecting shorebirds out there. And then it, it evolved into a lot, of, a lot of different facets of the job. And one of the big parts is you are immersed in this barrier beach landscape. You're living out there in a cabin with no power, no running water. You're just kind of out there, you and the birds and the coastline. Now, were you there year round? No, <laughs> I would usually show up for the season. It was a seasonal gig. Okay. It still is. We do have a Koti Ranger out there right now. I would show up in March or April, really when the birds started showing up, as they are a migratory bird species that I monitored, piping plovers, American oyster catchers, and least terns primarily. So when they started setting up for the gear, I would head out to the cabin. It's a little chilly out there in May, so build some some nice fires in the fireplace in that little cabin. And then I'd stay until September, October, whenever things started tapering off for the season and Nantucket started going a little bit dormant. Okay, so you were there long enough probably to notice some changes, even though it wasn't like a 50-year block of time. But what were some of the changes that you were able to document or you just sort of noticed anecdotally? I mean, every year is a little different. And with the birds, especially, they are going to set up wherever they have a little slice of beach that's above the tide line, a little little tidal flat for them to lay in a nest in and raise some chicks in. But the beach changes. It, it definitely changes seasonally throughout the year. And year to year, there's been some significant sites of erosion. We've lost some inside road on KOTU, which is the main access point for all the vehicles on the refuge and access getting out there in general. There's some spots that it, waves start to inundate during high tide events and storm surges and, you know, any, any easterly breeze that, that comes in off the ocean can really inhibit your ability to get out onto the refuge itself. So yeah, six years was was a lot. And there was some some slight changes within that time, some definitive washouts that were created by high high tides and storm events. But it's it's a barrier beach, so it's a dynamic ecosystem. It's used to that type of change. And it's built up over five to eight thousand years. So right. it's 
it's used to that level of changing constantly. In your position as the interpretive education coordinator, you're interfacing with the public quite a bit. What are some of the misconceptions people have about the refuge that you encounter? Most of them are, (laughs) they know how exposed it is. They know how hard it is to get to because you have to, you know, if you're coming from off island, you, you come into town, Nantucket, and you drive across the island with a four-wheel drive vehicle, you air down your tires and you drive over soft sand to get all the way to the end of Kotu where I would uh, stop managing out at the jetty that was facing town. It takes about an hour, an hour and 15 minutes to drive out there. So it's pretty far out. People that do go over to Kotu, they love being that separated from town, but it is, it's not for the faint of heart. And it's a lot of people buy rental Jeep and they say, I just want to go. I just want to get out on the beach. And a lot of times they end up getting stuck. So myself or member of the trustees of reservations team ends up pulling them out or, or digging them out. I've dug out a lot of stuck vehicles in the soft sand. What's the difference when you're communicating with the residents of the island versus tourists that are just coming over? Kotu attracts a lot of locals, a lot of people who grew up here or have been here for years. They like to get away from the hustle and bustle of downtown as well. And particularly these people who work during the season, you know, they're, they're seasonal residents and they know the swing and, and how busy it gets. Kotu is one of the most secluded spots that they can get to. They hop in their boats and go out and have a day on the beach. There's a lot of people from our community who love going out there and who love appreciating it. But there's a lot of tourists too. We get a lot of day trippers and and people who just kind of want to experience a different side of Nantucket. And KOTU is definitely that. You're about as close yet as far from town as you can possibly get. So the foundation does a lot of research. How are you able to bring that research and science into your interpretive work? Oh, when I was going to school, my professors would love to hit on this idea that You can be a scientist, you can be an educator, but sometimes the people that make the most difference are the science educators. So I have a data-minded science background. I have a master's degree in conservation biology, but I'm the son of a public school teacher, and I've been learning how to interact with the public and, and talk about concepts in science and throughout since I started. So since I was a little kid, basically. So I love the idea of bringing the the work that we do, which is so multifaceted, to people, Uh, whether they're locals, whether they're visitors, if it's their first time with us or it's their 50th Mornings for Members Walk. Um, I love bringing these really cool projects that often fly under the radar but can tell us so much about how our island exists and, and stays above water and, and thrives and is so vibrant and diverse. What role does citizen science play in the work that you do? We have a lot of citizen science projects. One of our major ones that we're doing right now, we're surveying horseshoe crabs at every high tide at different stages of the lunar cycle. So uh, we regularly engage with a lot of long-term volunteers and people who just love the work that we do to get out and walk the beaches and tell us what they're seeing. Also do a lot of work. We like to do a lot of things supporting birding as well on the island, which uh, eBird is a great citizen science program run by the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. People can go out on their own and collect lists and observe birds around the island. And if they're doing it on our properties, they can actually tag us and it will go back into our understanding of what species are using or breeding on our properties around the island. So those are two of the major ones, but we have a lot of different citizen science projects. There are people in your position in parks all over the United States who are having to think about how they bring climate change education into the work that they do. How's it coming across your plate? Well, we see the effects of climate change on multiple fronts. In our organization in particular, because we manage so much habitat and so much coastal habitat, we have to worry about that constantly through erosion, through storm surges, through how our wetlands are absorbing and, and protecting that coastline. 
So we mainly do a lot of work looking at climate change and looking at coastal resiliency in protecting the habitat that's doing its part. One of the big ways that we do that is protection and preservation of salt marsh habitat. Salt marsh is the best way that we found to soft armor our coastlines naturally. This is a a really complex ecosystem. It's very porous. It, It absorbs a lot of water. And the vegetation within a salt marsh also helps to slow wave action, which can help to mitigate that coastal erosion. Uh, So protecting large swaths of salt marsh habitat and making sure that we have room for it to expand because marshes are a living system. They migrate, they move, whatever the water is telling them to do. So we're thinking ahead using the best projections we have from NOAA, from the state, from these different organizations that look at sea level rise and how it will impact us going forward throughout the next several decades. I imagine you're in that cabin and you really were in a unique position. You're looking out on, on, into the ocean. Did you ever just ponder the issue of sea level rise because you were there for so long? Did you have those sort of deep thoughts on like what it might mean for what you're looking at? Oh, totally. When you live that close to the edge, you have to think about that. And it strong spring tides in May and June, the harbor waves were lapping at my door. And I had to get pulled off CO2 several times. My supervisor was very worried that I would get trapped in a hurricane out there. So she was very cognizant of that. Thank you, Karen. <laughs> so that is a an ever-present thing. And, and CO2 is it's a thin barrier beach property. It's really exposed. So you're feeling all those strong storms that are coming through. And sometimes it's kind of invigorating to to stand out there in a storm and and feel it coming through. But realizing that one one good storm that's hitting a, a perfect storm of the strength of it and also where it's landing on Nantucket can cause some dramatic changes within the beach ecosystem. I would constantly think about that and can't get away from it. I I would also lose a lot of nests during strong storms. And I know that this year in particular, you know, Memorial Day weekend, we just had a nice storm that washed through and it it knocked out several plover nests and some took out some chicks and some American oyster catcher nests and a whole eastern colony. So those birds that are used to living on the edge, they can adapt, they can move, but human infrastructure, especially the cabin that I was staying in needs a little bit more planning and a lot more time in order to make that resilient to uh, coastal erosion and the problems that we're dealing with with sea level rise and climate change. Do you have a favorite spot at the refuge? A favorite spot? Oh man, there's so many. It, anyone who's been out there just knows how tucked away and beautiful it can be. I'd say My favorite spot is First Point. It is directly across from the boat basin and from town on a good, calm, clear night. You can watch the lighthouse at Brant Point spin around and and actually hear conversations of all the people that are dining out, but you're, you're separated from it all. And First Point supports a really vibrant salt marsh habitat. There's a lot of nesting birds there, and it's a great spot to find migrant birds. So I would regularly see some really cool turns and some neat water birds moving through that area. Uh, and it's, it's just incredibly photogenic. I, I end up taking a lot of pictures there of the tidal marshes and uh, yeah, a lot of time spent on first point. Perfect. Okay, Neil, that was great. I appreciate you coming on the podcast and, and sharing your story. Doug, thanks for having me on. Really appreciate it. Hey adapters, joining me is Priscilla Johnson-Bender. Priscilla is a seasonal resident of Nantucket and the chair of the property committee of the Trustees of Reservation. Hi Priscilla, welcome to the podcast. Hi Doug, thank you for having me. So how long have you been a resident of Nantucket? Well, we've been coming up here for many decades with our kids, but we've been actually living on island in the season for the last seven years. Okay, so that's quite a while. And what role do you play with the Trustees of Reservation? You are the chair of the property committee. What does that mean? 
Yes. Well, for Nantucket, we have a property, only one property here, and that's Cascada Kotu Nature Preserve. And there are a group of people who are volunteers who live on the island and have an interest in the property and work to support it and support the rangers who manage it. Just describe that. How often do you meet? What are some of the issues that come up when the committee meets? Well, we meet two or three times a year in person and off season. We have a phone call once a year and we work on ways to support the growth of the Great Point Circle membership, which are people who really give it a higher level to support the mission of the trustees here on Nantucket. The trustees is a much larger organization that incorporates all of Massachusetts, but this one property of their 120 is the only one here. It's 1,100 acres of very, very fragile and imperiled lands along the coast. So we try very hard to do what we can to support it. As part of this podcast, there's a partnership between the Nantucket Conservation Foundation and the trustees. How does the foundation's work overlap with anything that you're doing? Oh, they overlap enormously. For one thing, the properties are kind of mosaic together. The Conservation Foundation, which is an amazing organization as well, has a number of properties alongside the trustees' properties out there. The gatehouse is an entryway that the trustees manages, but is owned by the Conservation Foundation. So they really work hand in glove and on the issues surrounding the nature and the preservation of the land and how we're going to manage it and regulate things that are going on out there. The two organizations work very closely. So even in the seven years that you've lived on the island, have you noticed changes when you go out to the beach? Are there things that stand out to you? Well, obviously, there's the erosion issue with the rising tides and the more severe storms. It's just really astounding. This past year, we had an enormous storm in December. I think it was around the 8th of December that really took out a chunk of the island. And I found just a week or so ago, I went out in a spot that I used to love to go to and sit and contemplate the ocean with my dog just doesn't exist. And it was almost like losing a friend to find that this physical place that I had spent so much time at was just gone. I had spent so many times, even in January, watching the snowflakes swirl over the water there with my dog. And literally this, the dune is gone. There's nothing there. Wow. That was kind of a shock. So as a resident too, and when you talk to other residents of Nantucket, how has the issue of climate change come up? Are people talking about it at all? Oh, absolutely. There's a whole commission that has been formed to talk about resiliency on Nantucket and its waterfront. The Cascada Kotu property really defines Nantucket as the shape of the island. If you just look at that iconic shape that you see on logos all over the place, that point heading up towards the northeast is really very defining for the image of Nantucket. And It's also defining for our waterways, the harbor that made Nantucket such a great whaling station. All of that is possible because of these barriers that protect the harbor front. And if that is to go and go and be washed away, then the entire ocean comes right into the town. It's just open. And that's an ecology disaster and it's a town disaster. So both the foundation and the trustees are talking more and not just talking, but they're doing adaptation planning, how we're going to adapt to climate change. Is that coming up at all with the work you're doing as chair of the property committee? So, yes, it's absolutely in everyone's minds. Most people who are there have a specific interest, either as recreation interests in terms of fishing or personal interest in that their homes are located in areas that are endangered. We aren't really responsible directly for policies around that, but it certainly is in everyone's mind that access to the point is going to be limited, that we might need to think about other ways to adapt to how we access it. The trustee's mission is really not just about preserving nature and special places, but it's also about inviting people in to enjoy those special places and how we engage people with them. And clearly that has to be rethought as the spaces themselves are more and more imperiled. Do we allow vehicles to travel over the dunes? Well, we we certainly block off vehicles during nesting season for the threatened shorebirds. Cascada Kotu is home to several different endangered and threatened species. Obviously, the piping plovers are everyone's favorite because they're adorable, but also terns and oyster catchers and northern harriers. All of these things are endangered just like the houses are. 
and we close things down to preserve them, maybe we need to think about other ways to engage people and bring them in to the space without endangering the dunes. Okay, so Nantucket is this world-class tourist destination. So you have the residents of the island, but then you have a steady flow of tourists, and especially in the summer. Do you feel the tourists understand what some of the long-term changes are going to be occurring to the island, especially in light of sea level rise? I think the ones who come here regularly and are really devoted to the island, the people who come up for a week or two weeks every year and have been coming up for a long time, those tourists probably do care about that very much. There are other people who come up for, you know, the nightlife and the summer sailing and things like that and might not be as aware of it. I think they're beginning to see a little bit more through social media, but the long-term tourists who come up year after year for a week, um, I think they are seeing it. So you obviously care deeply about the refuge and you're involved with the, the property committee. What's next for you? What, how are you going to stay involved? Oh, gosh. Well, I've been working to try to increase my own education on what the issues are and how we go about preserving the lands we care about, cleaning up the oceans. There's just so much to to learn about. And I think if I can help direct where we're putting our energies to study things, make new policies, or even put funding into research and initiatives and scholarship as part of the trustees, I think that might be helpful in our own little small corner of the world. Nantucket is one teeny island, but in many ways, it's a barometer. It's part of this incredible chain of barrier islands that extends from Long Island all the way up through Cape Cod and protects enormous amounts of homes on the mainland and harbor fronts on the mainland. And I think that if we can understand this one little piece here, maybe that's applicable in a broader sense to many more places. So my own studies, I hope, will enhance that. What is your favorite spot in the refuge? Oh, gosh. You know, there's just nothing like that lighthouse. When you come to Nantucket by boat, there's a time when you can't see shore on either side of you. You can't see what you've left behind and you can't see what's in front of you, especially if you're coming through the fog or at night and it's dark out. And then way off in the distance, you see that one little point of light or the lighthouse itself rising out of the water. And it's that first beacon of, ah, it's out there. That special place is there and we're going to find it. That coming to the island is just so special to be greeted by that point, a great point. It just, it makes your, your heart happy. So when you can go out there and sit there and it's one of the most peaceful places, as you said, there are a lot of tourists here. The population can go up of north of 60,000 people in the summer on this one little island. And that point is one place where you might find refuge even for a human, even if you're not one of the rare birds or something. It's a peaceful place where you can find res- refuge and just contemplate the ocean and the world. Perfect. Okay, Priscilla, thank you so much for coming on and sharing your story. Thank you, Doug. Hey, actors, I'm here with Tom O'Shea. Tom is the Managing Director of Resources and Planning at the Trustees of Reservations. Hi, Tom. Welcome to the podcast. Hi, Doug. Great to be here. You're actually returning to the podcast. We did the series back on some of the other properties that you manage, so it's great having you back on. Great to be here again and have this opportunity to talk about coastal resilience and our properties and just an excellent uh, opportunity to talk and engage further about it. Okay. For those who aren't familiar with those episodes, can you tell us briefly who are the Trustees of Reservations? What, What is your group? Sure. The Trustees of Reservations, we're a conservation organization and land trust based in Massachusetts. We've been around since 1891, actually the nation's oldest land trust. We own lots of properties across Massachusetts. So that makes us actually the largest coastal landowner in the state as far as being a private coastal landowner. So we own and protect around 120 miles of coastline. And so for us, we've been witnessing changes on our coastline firsthand now for the last five to 10 years, really, at unprecedented rates. And we have been preparing to address coastal change and climate now for the last three or four years in earnest as part of our strategic plan. And for us, focus on Nantucket is critical. It is truly on the front lines of climate change here in Massachusetts on the coast. 
seeing some of the highest rates of erosion anywhere in the state. So can you tell us a bit more specifically about your role with the trustees? Sure. Yeah. And my role with the trustees has been to help lead our coastal strategy and initiative at the trustees. The first time we've had that as a real focus for our organization. And it's probably one of the first recognitions of that the organization has to adapt to climate change. Many conservation organizations are really all about protecting things in perpetuity forever. But now, you, you know, you have to really think as an organization and in my role about how we now reframe sustainability and preserving places and conserving places in this kind of dynamic environment and uncertainty. And so we have really now, in my role, started to think about how we make our places more resilient, where we need to adapt, where we need to retreat, how do we protect our properties and the the exceptional resources on them. And so that's really been a major focus of mine and my team over the last five years. When people become members of conservation groups or they're board members, they have certain expectations. And as you just described, things are changing. How do you bring along those people who support your mission along this new climate journey? Yeah, that's a great question, Doug. I would say that for everybody, including our own organizational you know, teams and staff, as well as our visitors and members and donors, is that we all have to start learning the language of climate. And it's a fluency that you have to build up around the concepts, the language that we use, and the the future. And what does that look like? So there's kind of just building that fluency, which I think we've done in this podcast, actually, is, is a big part of how we do that, actually, Doug. I think you're doing a lot of that great work, too. So that helps us gain that fluency and awareness. And then I think the next part is how do we manage expectations, which is to say that, yeah, these some places are changing at more or less different rates. There are more or less different options and opportunities to create resiliency and adapt. And in some places, we may have to accept loss. And in some places, we may have to change how we manage, how we recreate and use these properties, that they won't look like the way they have for years. And and this is true, of course, on the coast, as the coast has always been changing. So I think we're in a constant dialogue, Doug, with everybody. So, you know, from the perspective that I think all of us are learning, we're also going to have to start adjusting and managing our expectations and being thoughtful about where we intervene with adaptations and where it may not make sense. And this is a constant dialogue, Doug. Okay. So why is the CO2 refuge so important of all these properties that you manage? Why is this one so important? Yeah, I mean, of course, it's it's iconic, not only here in Massachusetts and Nantucket, but just nationally and internationally, right? It's one of the few cuspid spit formations of a barrier beach system in the world. I think we've been um, working towards designation of the property as a national natural landmark. It's incredibly important locally as well as, you know, incredible place for recreation. It's got over five miles of beach. If Doug, if you ever get a chance to go out there, you can just get out there with an oversand vehicle, go down a couple miles, park, and you've got a lot of the beach to yourself. I mean, it's just an amazing experience. You've got excellent fishing. Wildlife is tremendous out there. You'll see rare species. We have a rare cactus out on that area. And so it just got so many unique characteristics and experiences, really unlike almost any place else in the state. And so it's super iconic and and valuable. And then of course, not only as a refuge, but potentially now we're learning that you know, it could and has been providing storm protection to Nantucket Harbor. And there's that connection, right, between the built environment and the natural coast. And now seeing that you can't just look at Nantucket as a harbor unto itself, but you've got to look at its connectedness and the land, larger coast landscape with the refuge. You know, of course, we've got the lighthouse out there. I'm sure people have told you about that as an iconic cultural feature, which has been moved once already further westward. So it's an amazing place. Definitely, I would say, is one of the uh, most memorable places of any coastal area I've been to on the East Coast. Well, I'll have to get there. <laughs> That's my goal. <laughs> there's, there's my sale, Doug, for you. All right. I need to get the end of Martha's Vineyard, all of it. Yes, I, I hope to go. Okay. So with the trusted reservations, you have this challenge that you're managing these amazing properties, but you have multiple purposes for them. And like two of the main ones are for public access, but then you're actually trying to protect the natural resources on those landscapes. And sometimes they don't cooperate very well together. Tell us a bit about that. Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. Our whole organization's mission is really all about that. 
is to provide places for exceptional places for public enjoyment and for preserving ecological, significant ecological resources. So we've got to do that. That's part of what we have to do. And, you know, part of the the value of it is that these places have to have a connection and attachment to people, right? People have to feel that that they can enjoy them in order to value them. So there's, so it's a, it's a good natural connection to have, right? It's at the same time, there's a tension and, in particular, I mean, where, where we're seeing it on some of the barrier beach systems is that for these long barrier beach stretches, right? We're talking, Doug, places two, three, four, five miles, especially like Cascada. It's hard to get to them, right? To get to enjoy all of them unless you have an oversand vehicle. So that right there, those vehicles can have impacts to the integrity and the resiliency of those dune, fragile dune systems. So you got to be really careful about where you place those. There's a state barrier beach guidelines that give you best practices to follow, you know, in terms of where you put your symbolic fencing for corridors, for travel, for the, the vehicles, when you close areas down, plus you have to balance it with shorebirds that are nesting out there right now as we speak. And there are state guidelines and, and regulations around protecting the shorebirds. And of course, you know, these are fragile systems anyway, so you don't want to be driving up over the dune grass, which is actually holding the sand in place, you know, helping it to protect against erosion. So you've got all these different factors going on out there and you're trying to balance all of them and, you know, things are changing, right? So the, these systems are even more vulnerable to accelerated storm surge and erosion. And I don't know that when people go out to the beach, Doug, they're thinking, oh, yeah, I've got to I've got to really protect the beach resiliency. You know, boy, yeah, I mean, this is why they're changing things. We have to start getting people to see that you know, these environments are changing and we're going to have to start to change how we use them. And that might mean some changes in access. But it isn't to say that we're going to completely stop it. No, we, would, we wouldn't do that. It's not part of our mission. We want people out there to enjoy so it's a constant conversation now as we start to think about how the trustees can model best practices for public access, say with overseeing vehicles, could be also with dogs. Dogs present issues and challenges with disturbance of shorebirds, for instance. There's, there's a lot of questions about uh, that. And then, you know, there's another side of this, Doug, which is that people have had, you know, the option of driving all the way from the beginning of Cascada Co. 2 all the way out to Great Point at the end with a lighthouse. And along the way, they're predicting more chance for breaches and if there's a breach in the beach, right, you're not going to drive through through the breach. And it's going to really limit certainly oversand vehicle access, even walking access to these long stretches of beaches. So that's an, also a, something we want to think about is how do we, you know, make those areas that are most vulnerable to breaches stronger, you know, maybe less likely to breach so that we can continue to provide public access. We have rare species out there, right? So there's also things like the cactus and other plants. And, and, and you know, we've been able to manage that in terms of not creating impacts from, you know, public access walking or, or overseeing vehicles. So there are a number of issues that we have to look at. And I think that whatever we can do to bring people out there while these areas are changing, is going to be important. And I think if we can engage people in volunteer opportunities that people can see firsthand and, and vet, be more invested in the care of these refuges as, par- as well as you know, enjoying them. But I think just to wrap on that, Doug, that, you know, even I, and maybe you too, when you go out to beaches, right, you're there to recreate and have fun and have a good time. And how do we as organizations start to engage people in those conversations and learn about what's happening while they're recreating? And that's going to be a challenge for everybody. You are partnering with the Nantucket Conservation Foundation and, and Cormac Collier. He kick-started this whole episode off and you're the one wrapping it up. But can you tell us a bit why that partnership? Sure. I mean, I think it, it leverages the strength of both organizations. We both own land out there on the refuge. So we are neighbors. We are partners with the same type of mission, both public access and conservation. And they bring a real local perspective and local knowledge of the issues and the trustees also who have been, you know, an owners out there for a long time and are working from a statewide perspective, bring a statewide lens as well. And so I think it's a great partnership to bring the two organizations together to address what is really both a, a large scale issue and also a very local issue. And we're really pleased to be in partnership with Nantucket Conservation Foundation. And they also have 
like us, uh, ecologists and scientists and land managers that have expert, professional expertise to bring uh, ideas and perspectives and new solutions to, to addressing adaptation. Okay. So what's next with the partnership and what's next for the trustees and in the CO2 refuge? Right now, I mean, we're looking to get an idea of what kind of beach interventions and alternatives for beach interventions would work, say, whether it's dune restoration or beach nourishment, or is it some other type of uh, technique or a combination of different types of resiliency techniques to really address those areas I talked about that could be most vulnerable to breaching and accelerated erosion. So one is just get a handle on what would we even do out there to protect those most vulnerable areas that are critical for public access, habitat, and, and storm protection, ultimately. So we're going to look at all those options. We hope to engage the public in what those options could look like. And I think that's going to be really helpful to start getting, you know, everybody in the community to see, oh, all right, these are the real on the ground challenges and ideas of thinking of how you make your beaches more resilient, what that means to all of us. So this is going to be a great opportunity to to engage on the thinking, get some some buy-in and support for moving forward with some real beach resiliency trials I think this podcast and we have a 360 virtual panorama tour that we're creating with NCF that will feature as well. It's going to be excellent with drone fit- footage of just amazing scenery and perspectives with some narration of modes and nodes of different areas to explain what's happening at different parts of the beach. So that'll be great. And then we hope to you know continue forward with the community, the town and thinking about the bigger challenges in Nantucket and how we can support through our work those broader challenges on the island. We have a State of the Coast report as well that'll be going out and be released in August, which will include Martha's Vineyard, Nantucket, and Gosnell with the Elizabethan Islands. So that'll also give kind of a big picture view of, of this issue on the island. So I think this is just the beginning of the partnership and and I think really a beginning for Nantucket as an island to start to showcase for the rest of the state, if not the country, you know, how an island that's so dependent on its coastal resources can, can face this challenge. You know, it's an iconic place. It's been dealing with changes in the ocean for thousands of years and, uh, and it will continue to. So I think this is a great opportunity to start to build energy and momentum for the climate adaptation on Nantucket. Okay. Do you have a favorite spot in the KOTU refuge? Yeah, there's, there's an area, it's called the Galls, and you can see the ocean on either side, right? You've got sort of the bay and the ocean on either side, and then you can get some, some nice dune grasses that grow in between them. And uh, sometimes you'll see harrier hawks and the northern harriers flying, just hovering quietly over those dune grasses in the quiet wind. Just amazing to just see that on a quiet day with just the wind, the sound of the ocean, seeing the birds fly, cruising over the dunes. Sometimes you'll see a snowy owl standing sentry out there in the middle of this sort of barren beach landscape with ocean on either side. Just really amazing, amazing place to be. And uh, you see seals, whales, you can get, you know, great fishing right from that spot. So pretty, pretty cool area. Awesome. Okay, Tom, thanks for coming on and sharing your story. And I look forward to the next episode. Great. Thank you, Doug. Look forward to it. Okay, adapters, that is a wrap. Thanks to Cormac, Nathaniel, Teal, Neil, Priscilla, and Tom for joining me on this very special episode. There are exciting things happening on Nantucket Island. And as you heard, much is at stake. In the next episode of this two-part series, we'll focus on how the island and the people can adapt to the climate-driven changes ahead. Thanks again to the Trustees of Reservations and the Nantucket Conservation Foundation for sponsoring this episode. I hope you've enjoyed this journey to one of the most beautiful and historic islands in the United States. Okay, adapters, keep up the great work. I'll see you next time.